Hi there and welcome to TVBF Online. Uh, we're coming to the end of a series we've been looking at in Acts of the Apostles called Scattered Servants. And we've been looking at this in the context of understanding how the church develops and grows in its mission in terms of being missional in taking the message uh, of the good news of Jesus Christ into the world that Jesus is Lord. And here we've reached Acts chapter 12 and it's a story where the, um, uh, the church is beginning to grow but there's also uh, a sense in which there's opposition developing. And to increase the popularity and win over the Jewish leaders then Herod uh, actually decides that he will start to persecute the church and God uses the prayers of the church to rescue Peter in a very supernatural way much to the amazement and astonishment of both Herod and the church itself. So from Acts chapter 12 uh, we read these words. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James the brother of John put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to, the, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Uh, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, Quickly, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was was doing and what was really happening he thought he was seeing a vision they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city it opened for them by itself and and then they went through it when they had walked the length of one street suddenly the angel left him okay we're looking at this whole passage here in the context of how do we serve with prayer as essential part of uh, understanding what mission is but before we go any further let's just pray together father god as we look at your word encourage us to deep briefly uh, uh, breathe deeply rather gather our scattered thoughts and our senses as we focus on your presence and would you please unleash your holy spirit upon us this morning so that as we breathe in again we are conscious of your grace and your love impacting and empowering us now. Amen. OK, let's have a look at the book. Anne Lamott is an American writer and she wrote a book on prayer and she titled it Help, Thanks and Wow. Now that title would have resonated with these first century believers because what they're doing is seeking God in terms of uh, coming against the powerful opposition that they face from Herod and his soldiers. Now Herod has a, a Hitler-like complex in terms of popularity and he wants to be popular in everything he's doing. And so the way he raises his popularity stakes is by turning his attention to the church. The church had a mission and a message they took into the world was that Jesus is Lord. And whenever, whenever we proclaim that message, then we will find ourselves in situations which can be quite challenging for us. The 20th century church leader, John Stott, writes about this passage and he says, Here are two communities, uh, the world and the church, and they're arrayed against each other each wielding an appropriate weapon. On one side there is the authority of Herod with the power of the sword and the, and the uh, security of the prison. And on the other side there is the church. Turn to prayer, the power which the powerless always possess. 
So how do we understand how we use prayer and we, we become servants of prayer and we become people who serve with prayer as we push out the message and the mission of Jesus Christ today? Well, the first thing we need to understand is in the, that in the, in the face and in the challenge of persecution, prayer encourages us to persevere because that's what the church actually does here. Herod Agrippa is a formidable opponent to the early church and they confront him in the same way as David confronts Goliath. And when David confronted Goliath, he could have either focused on the giant and stumbled himself or focused on God and watched the giant tumble. And that's exactly what the early church do here. Their focus is not upon Herod and on how powerful he is, but upon how powerful God is and the message they actually take into the world. A few years ago, a Roman coin was found. And on uh, one side of the coin, there was the head of the emperor. And on the other side of the coin, on the reverse of the coin, there was a picture of uh, an ox and an altar and a plough. And the inscription underneath simply said, ready for either. And that's what they're saying. We're ready to be either sacrificed or to surrender ourselves to ploughing this message that Jesus is Lord into the culture of our day. And to going up against the powerful civic society in which we live in. Now James, in verse 2 of chapter 12, had already given his life. His life had already been taken by Herod. Way back in Acts chapter 4, the church had been facing persecution again. And when they'd faced persecution there, their focus had been upon God. And despite the threats and everything coming around them, the one thing they asked God to do for them was to give them courage and give them stability as they faced the challenge. They didn't ask for the struggle to be taken away or the challenges to go away. They wanted courage to persevere. In fact, they actually turned around and understood that God was all powerful. In fact, they understood that prayer was the key of the day and the lock of the night. And the reason why we pray is not because we're looking for a good outcome and neither do we pray to manipulate God into doing our will. The reason for praying is to demonstrate the countercultural and counterworldly wisdom of God that the early church displayed. So prayer needs to become something that we centre in on and we persevere in through the context of persecution, whether that persecution is uh, evident um, or whether it's subtle. We just need to be people who use prayer as a foundation. And the second thing to understand about this is the actual very fundamental issue of the challenge of prayer, because these people pressed into prayer. A few years ago in the United States, a survey was done of some of the top 25 churches and they asked them, what are the top 10 priorities you actually have as a church? And only one in the 25 said that prayer needs to be a top priority for us. When we see the early church, we see them in prayer and the results of them praying as they press into prayer is that Peter, Peter is released. He doesn't understand what's going on, but he is released because the people are praying. And it's interesting as, they, as to how they pray, because in verse 5 it simply says to us, they prayed earnestly. Now that word literally means to stretch. It means to have a considerable period of prayer. So these people are praying as a group with intensity and durability through this time of persecution. So prayer for them is something that they press into God for and about over certain issues. And we need to be people who keep on doing that. In Acts 4, they turn around and they actually say to God in Acts 4 verse 24, when they're under persecution, they say, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it. You are the sovereign God. You are able to do something that we cannot do in this situation, but you are more than capable of doing. 
A few years ago, I was reading a story about a couple, a Christian couple who um, uh, came out of Iran because of uh, fierce persecution. They were going through physical persecution and they emigrated to the United States. Within a few months, the wife of the, the couple was asking to go back to Iran. And the husband said, why? Because everything is secure here in the United States. We're not facing the same kind of persecution. She said, I know we're not, but there is a sleepiness here about these people in the context of prayer. And I am feeling sleepy. The sleepiness around me is infecting me. And I want to go back to Iran because there I know I am strong. And I know I can stand against that physical persecution, but what I cannot stand against here is this sleepiness that is infecting my faith. She saw a spiritual sleepiness which was greater than the physical persecution in Iran. And I just want to ask a question about us today as a church, as we step forward, as we do things. Are we sleepy in our context of prayer? Are we, are, we, are we becoming infectious with a sleepiness and infecting one another so that few of us actually begin to understand the importance of prayer? Or are we, are, are we as a fellowship developing and becoming more durable in our understanding of where we put prayer as a priority? As we move forward with the message that Jesus is Lord in the mission we have and in the context of pushing that mission out through Telster and the development of the TVC and everything else we need to do for the future. And the final thing we need to think about this is the challenge of perplexity. How do you sustain momentum when you have unanswered prayer? Now, I don't know about you, but one of the biggest challenges I face is unanswered prayer. It's happened to me in the past. It's happened to me in the present. It's, it's, I know it's going to happen to me in the future. And the church was like that here. You see, because Peter has been released, but James was executed. Now, when I start to try to understand that, does that mean that the church prayed less for James and more for Peter? Does it mean that James had less faith and Peter had more faith? There's a Cuban uh, Christian called Justo Gonzalez and he writes about this in the context of this passage. He said the death of James does not imply that James had less faith than Peter or that the church prayed less effectively for him than Peter. Rather, while God clearly can deliver his servants from suffering and death, he is also glorified as by Jesus himself through their obedience unto death. I find that very, very challenging. Maybe you like that as a solution, or maybe you prefer the solution that P.T. Forsyth, the 20th century Christian, said. He said, one day we shall, one day we shall come to heaven, where we shall gratefully know that God's great refusals were sometimes the true answers to our truest prayers. Or maybe you prefer the story of Johnny Erickson Tarda, who at the age of 17 misjudged the depth of the water she was diving into. And ever since that day, she's lived paralysed from the neck down. Now, she's been prayed over many times. She's been anointed with oil. She's been in prayer meetings. She's uh, asked for prayer herself, but she still faces unanswered prayer. How do you still have a momentum to keep going in taking the message and the mission of Jesus into the world when that happens? Well, this is what she says about unanswered prayer. She says, as the more intense the pain, the closer God's embrace. The greatest unanswered prayer that Jesus prayed was the prayer that he prayed in Gethsemane when he asked to be released from the cross. But there wasn't release, there was relinqu relinquishment to going to Calvary so that we, you and I could know God's grace and God's mercy and God's salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But one day we shall look back on our life as we look back on the life of Jesus and then we shall understand why it was that God uh, denied some of our most heartfelt prayers. The New Testament writer um, or scholar Howard Marshall says that when the church prays, the, course, the cause of God will always go 
forward. Now that's astounding. Because what is even more astounding is that Peter doesn't understand what's actually happened. And I love it the way Tom Wright says about this place here. He says, for one moment, we are not seeing here a bunch of heroes and heroines. Because they can't understand what's gone on when, when he's knocking on the door and let me in. And they say, you must be mistaken, Rhoda, in, in, in what, you're, what you're seeing and what you're hearing. These are not heroes of the faith anymore. They're the same kind of muddled, half-believing, faith one minute and then doubt the next sort of people that most Christians are that we know. They were amazed. This is the wow factor of what they pray. They prayed for help. They gave thanks. And it's wow. First computer I ever bought was an Amstrad. I don't remember a lot about it now. But I remember it a massive manual. And the only thing I can remember about the manual was one simple line which said, make sure the computer is plugged into the power source. And when we face persecution, when we serve God as servants with prayer today, when we engage in the message and the mission that Jesus is Lord, we need to be plugged into the power source. The power source always reminds us that prayer is able to transform negative circumstances and able to deal with the mysteries we find around unanswered prayer. Yet the genuine power of the kingdom of God always helps us in that perspective. Prayer is about FaceTiming God. It's about staying connected. This is something that each of us can simply do day in and day out. So when we're asked to pray about something, when we're asked to seek God's face, we put that as a priority in our thinking about how we serve as scattered servants today. Prayer brings us to the very heart of Christianity because prayer is about the relationship we have with the living God and when we see that and when we understand that then we understand the great power that can be released through prayer we just need to be people who understand what this early church understood that when we face persecution in whatever way it comes when we face unanswered prayer we still have a momentum to go forward because we're facing up to the challenge of prayer as we press further in with God. That's something we can do this week as we turn our face towards God and we ask him to lead us and to guide us. Let's pray together. Father, would you encourage us to be people who understand that in the face of persecution, you encourage us to persevere in our prayer. In the challenge of prayer, you encourage us to keep pressing in with you. And in the unanswered prayers that we actually have, you encourage us with the momentum of seeing what you're doing and beginning to understand that one day you will answer the prayers that we've prayed many times. But keep us in a place where we're always praying and always seeking your face and always looking for the wow factor of what you can do through our lives when we give ourselves to prayer. Amen.